Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise this evening in adjournment proceedings to pursue a question that I asked of the Prime Minister November 12th, rather November 21st of 2012. It related to the connection between, as I see it, what we're pursuing in the Canada-China Investment Treaty, which is as we know, been signed in Vladivostok in September of 2012, uh, was placed before this place for 21 sitting days in which unfortunately, and I stress unfortunately is a rather a, a, a weak term for what I regard as a large uh, de democracy deficit and a tragedy that we didn't get to debate the Canada-China Investment Treaty, but it is now sitting before Privy Council and the point that uh, the Privy Council of this country, most Canadians would take that term to mean the cabinet, at the time that they decide to uh, pass an order in council, the Canada-China Investment Treaty will be uh, legally binding on Canada and given its difficult provisions, uh, very difficult to exit the Canada-China Investment Treaty compared to NAFTA, for instance, which has a six-month exit clause that can be exercised by any one of the parties, Canada, the U.S., or Mexico. The Canada-China Investment Treaty is uh, in effect for a first 15-year period. If a future government wants to exit the treaty, they need to give a one-year written notice, and any existing uh, investments from the People's Republic of China within Canada would be further protected for another 15 years after we try to exit the treaty. So it's essentially locking us in for 31 years. So I'd raised the issue with the Prime Minister on November 21st because he was just back, as we recall, earlier in November, the Prime Minister had been on a trade mission to India. And some of the news reporting at the time had been a little misleading. It had suggested that we had a treaty with India on investments and that the Indian Parliament was not yet ready to vote on that treaty. And the Prime Minister's response was, was you know, he was right. I, I had uh, taken the newspaper coverage at face value. We do not yet have an investment treaty with India. And since the time that has elapsed, since I could pursue this question in uh, adjournment proceedings, a lot has happened in India on this subject. And Canadians, and I think I'm looking forward to the government representative's response to this, India is taking a very dim view of investment treaties, such as the one that we now that now sits before Privy Council between Canada and the People's Republic of China. This class of agreements, investor state provisions, do not open up new markets necessarily, certainly the one with China doesn't. Uh, what they do is give foreign investors superior rights to seek arbitration damages against the country in which they're investing. In this case, in the Canada in the case of India, India has decided after a raft of suits from foreign corporations, they're looking at upwards of $5 billion in current arbitration charges against India. As recently as late January of 2013, the Indian government has decided to put a freeze on all investment agreements. So certainly any hopes Canada has for getting a new investor state agreement with India are on hold because India is putting on hold all investor state agreements and they want to reopen and renegotiate the ones they already agreed to. This puts India in the same category with Australia that did a full cost benefit analysis of investor state provisions and decided they are not of benefit to Australia. South Africa is now also re-examining investor state agreements. So I think it's time for Canada to do a cost benefit analysis as India has done as is doing, as Australia has done, and not only refused to ratify the Canada-China Investment Treaty, never enter into one of these things ever again. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of International Trade. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I uh, thank the member from Sandwich Gulf Islands for for uh, her interest on, on this subject and and wish her, uh, wish her good luck in... in uh, and maybe reaching a better understanding of it, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and I know she's, she's new to this House, so she may not be aware that, that prior to us forming government in 2006, treaties such as the FIPA with China were never brought to this place. There was no opportunity to debate them. There was no discussion about them. So when we formed government in 2006, I think it was around 2007, we brought in the uh, 
the, the rule, the treaties would be tabled in the House of Commons for 21 sitting days. Of course, the Honourable Member didn't take advantage of those 21 days. Uh, unfortunately, she, her, her party is not large enough to take advantage of those 21 days to force debate. The official opposition didn't take advantage of that opportunity to force debate on this issue. And the Liberal Party of Canada didn't take the opportunity to force debate on this issue. So what we have is quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, a, a whole lot of innu innuendo and, and rumor and, and quite, quite frankly, some misinformation, although I'll be fair to the member from Sandy Gulf Islands, she is not anywhere near the rumor and innuendo that the NDP have put onto this issue. The, the, uh, the, the principle, of course, of a FIPA or Foreign Investment Promotion and Protection Agreement with China is to make sure that Canadian investments in China are, are protected and likewise have reciprocity. So Chinese investments in, in Canada are, are protected. The member's quite right when she said that this is a 15 year period and at the end of that period either side can decide that uh, either the Chinese or, or our own, own ourselves can say we would opt out of this. Obviously, those, those investments that are already made need some longevity and some protection, so another 15 years for those investments already made is not untoward and it's not unreasonable. And I suspect with the Honourable Member's background as a lawyer, she probably uh, wrote a number of agreements similar to that herself in, in the past. You know, this is about giving Canadian companies investing in China the same rights and privileges that a Chinese company would have. This is about protecting Canadian foreign direct investment in China. And we can't do that, Mr. Speaker, without allowing those same rights and those same privileges to the Chinese. It's called reciprocity. It's called fairness. It's called reasonable rules-based trading. You know, the, the other thing that really really needs to be brought up, and, I, and again, I appreciate the Honourable Member didn't go there, uh, along with the, the fear-mongering from the NDP. Uh, this in no way, and I'll repeat this, this, this treaty in no way in, in, impedes on Canada's ability to regulate uh, and to legislate on such areas as the environment, on culture, on safety, on health, on conservation. So, so what this does is establish a clear set of rules for trading and investment between Canada and China. It promotes trade, it helps the Canadian economy, and it provides jobs and opportunities for Canadian workers. This is a good agreement, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Sandwich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Um, let me amend my earlier statement uh, to make it very clear that I also believe the Canada-China Investment Treaty will create a chill for future Canadian governments if we ratify it on those very areas, environment, health, safety, labour. Let me move to his point that uh, I may be new to this House, but uh, I didn't just drop off the turnip truck. I've been working on investment treaties for a very long time. You go back to Chapter 11 of NAFTA, which is the first in the world, now, of course, that was subjected to a vote in this House, but that was because NAFTA was a much larger treaty and had to have lots of other ancillary laws changed. Interestingly enough, if a U.S. investor in Canada, if Canada were to give a six-month notice to exit NAFTA, there is no grandfathering of other investments in the sense that the Canada-China Investment Treaty is very unusual in having a 15-year first period and a further 15-year lock-in. This treaty is one that should never be ratified and Canada should follow India's lead and Australia's lead and study this whole area to see if on a cost-benefit analysis they are worth what the, the paper they're written on to protect Canada's interests. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, I, I know I only have a minute to sum up, so I'm going to try to stick to a couple of important issues and, and, and just quite frankly and, and simply correct the record. Again, no way, shape, nor form does this treaty impair on Canada's ability to regulate and legislate in areas such as the environment, culture, safety, health, and conservation. The Honourable Member is incorrect, and that is fear-mongering, and that is following in the footsteps of the NDP. It's very unfortunate to hear that type of rhetoric in the House, quite frankly, Mr. Speaker. This is no different than 24 other foreign investment promotion and protection agreements 
that we have already signed with other countries around the world. This is no different and, and very similar to the agreements that apparently dangerous countries, according to the Honourable Member, such as New Zealand, Germany, the Netherlands, and Belgium, and Japan have already signed with China. There's nothing on toward here, Mr. Speaker. This again is broken down to rules-based trading. Everybody knows the rules. That's fair trading.